It's nice to see so many faces on a Sunday morning at a conference. Um, I have the pleasure to chair this uh, morning's keynote lecture. As a matter of fact, I was asked to do so yesterday because the, the plant chair isn't here. So um, in order to introduce Vladek, I um, tried to find some of his history on the internet last night. But there isn't all that much you can find on the internet. So I don't know what he's hiding. Um, so I, I, I can tell you what I know. Since last night, Vladek is the um, chair of the IUCR Commission on Biological Macromolecules. So that's your representation in the IUCR. That's an important job. Um, thanks for doing that, by the, uh, by the way. Um, now, Vladek is a, is a physicist from Poland. He got his um, bachelor, master's, and PhD degree in Warsaw. And then at some point moved to the United States, where he's a professor at the um, University of um, Virginia in Charlottesville. And in the last, he's of course very well known for his contributions in, in the field of um, data processing and structure solution. Everybody um, remembers Denso and HKL 2000 and HKL 3000 and so on. Um, but lately he got into data mining. Um, looking at databases, trying to extract information from the databases. And um, when you do that, sometimes you come across some surprises, and I think we will hear some, of, about, uh, some things about that in his talk today. So, Vladik, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you to the stage, which is all yours from now on. Action. Uh, and I obviously I would like to thank the organizer for inviting me here. It's a great pleasure to be here, especially the first time in India. And uh, some of the slides which I will show you, i shown before, but some are completely new. But this is the something which you always have to do if you have a large talk, that it's, we cannot talk about what we are doing, we have to talk about what others are doing, which usually it's more important. So crystallographic tools towards understanding of macromolecular structure function relation. In fact, we should ideally have only one tool, yes? that we have so much data, so many structures, that it, would, it should be enough, so many ligands, 70,000 structures with ligands in PDB, that it should be enough to sit in front of the computer and uh, just make uh, or design drug in a matter of minutes, or if we have something parallel computer, in a matter of seconds. Yes, so it's unknown why uh, there is such a problem. Uh, and we have here a lot of various databases, and uh, I am biased, so I put PDB in the center, but we have to realize that uh, there is tremendous exchange of data between various data resources and one error in one place has tremendous ripple effect. And quite often we underestimate this ripple effect. And the real problem with all of data resources, and I'm sorry because I was optimistic putting this table, uh, but this was, uh, actually it's already printed in the methods in macromolecular biology, molecular biology. Uh, we divided everything into four classes or four categories of the data resources. Archives, repositories, databases, and advanced information systems. And we have very few advanced information systems, if, if any. Why? Because 
we need to do extensive curation. We have to integrate everything with external resources. We have to provide effective data search. Uh, tools which you can user can customize, full validation mechanism uh, for basically all users. Uh, uh, data have to be structured and distributed and updated. And uh, it should be provided for organization or be public. But the problem is that uh, if we are looking at all of this, at cost of all of this, if the only thing which is relatively inexpensive is storage. Yes, people quite often they are telling about the number of uh, terabytes or petabytes uh, storage which they have. But in fact, this is, these days it's not a problem. The problem is to organize that. And creating a data ar archive is something very, very easy because we, everything is cheap except of storage, yes, because in that case the storage is uh, relatively more expensive because we are just dumping the data. The problem is that we cannot find uh, what we are really looking at in case of the archive. And it's like a diamond necklace on the landfill. If somebody by mistake deposit diamond necklace to the trash basket, afterward we can look forever, but we will never find that. And the same is with various archives, which sometimes we have in our labs. At least it happened to me from time to time. If I am trying to recover something which I collected 20 years ago, and we, I have some tapes, I can read these tapes, but I really do not know where these data are exactly. So this uh, uh, computer approach is a theory. And as we uh, all know, uh, in theory, there is no difference between theory and practice. Unfortunately, in practice, it is. And instead of having computer, we have to use quite often our brain, and I recommend that very strongly, by the way, and computer is just helping the brain. So the real tool for uh, drug discovery, and as a matter of fact, for any uh, field of science, the best tool is brain, and nobody found better tool so far. The rest of the talk will be from the user perspective. The, and the user perspective is, I mean, my user perspective is that I have over 400 uh, deposits, around 200 papers published, but probably around 80 structural papers. So. Uh, 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 on this fraction of the deposits or fraction of the structures are published. Uh, and I, as everybody else, we would like to make some impact. Yes, how to measure the impact of what we are doing. And uh, one year ago, uh, there was a paper about RCR, Relative Citation uh, Factor. Why? Because it's obvious that paper which was published 20 years ago might have more uh, citations than paper which was published two years ago. And they, they have very smart way of taking that into account. And if you will look and what we have done, we took all primary citations from PDB 
and check their RCR. And there are 149 papers with RCR higher than 20. And uh, it is related to 213 deposits, and there is a little over 700 deposits with RCR higher than 10. And I put here the first 20 uh, papers, or first, it's little more deposits as, as you see. And it's very, very interesting. This is really, if you will look at these first 20 papers, you more or less you would expect that. Uh, and if you will look on all papers, I mean, all, all uh, uh, deposits, we see that basically there are very few deposits which are uh, more RCR higher than 10. And in fact, 10 is uh, uh, RCR 10 for a paper which was published 15 years ago is equivalent to 400 citations, which is not bad. But the first thing which shocked me, that if you will look at these two curves, basically all PD, fraction of PDB and fraction of structured genomics was more or less the same, yes? So that this, as some people were saying, structures which were not necessary to anybody had the same impact factor except of these uh, top structures as everything else. So we were, the people who were in structured genomics, they were not doing so badly as some people think. Uh, and Two years ago, we have a talk, Cryo-EM in the Age of X-ray Crystallography. And you can see that this is uh, by methods, uh, X-ray, NMR, and uh, Cryo-EM. And you see that Cryo-EM is significantly higher, uh, again, by uh, fraction of structures. And in fact, we do not have cryo-EM in uh, age of crystallography. We have just opposite. We have X-ray crystallography in the age of cryo-EM. And this is the reason why people who should be here went to the cryo-EM talk. <laughs> yes, that hope in cryo-EM. But X-rays are not so bad. Because if you will look at the total RCR in PDB, you see that cryo-EM is not, or electron microscopy is still relatively low. So it's a big hope that we will do something much, much better uh, in the future. And I have that hope too. But we still, the Basic method is X-ray crystallography. I'm sorry. Uh, and what's more, when we are writing a paper, quite often we have a clash with reviewer. Because again, uh, reviewer, I, I got two times uh, the statement that this reviewer is disappointed that computational results are not backed by simple experiment. And the simple experiment, as you can imagine, is X-ray structure. And this is again, and we were working very hard on X-ray structure, but we couldn't get sample. Yes, and people do not believe in computational results because computational results are not always uh, matched with experiments which are done 
later. They almost always match with experiments which were done before, but they do not match with experiments which were done earlier. So we have to use uh, some way of collecting data, and this is the list of the um, most productive beamlines in the sense of number of PDB deposits. We can do that in the sense of molecular weight too. It will be very, very similar. And as you, uh, again, maybe it's not seen very well, but we, um, here we uh, make indication of the detector type, uh, synchrotron, beamline, uh, whether it was bending magnet or insertion device. Uh, uh, and you see, there is no really relations between what we have on the beamline and what we are getting, what equipment we have and what we are getting. Uh, and why is that? Because on this, in, in principle, synchrotron uh, protein crystallography synchrotron experiment is very simple. Yes, if you would describe to physicists what you are doing, he would tell you, he or she would tell you, okay, anybody can do that. Yes, I cannot imagine something simpler. Uh, because we have some type of detector, detectors are perfect. Uh, high flux, almost too high now, yes, and many beam lines we, people attenuate the flux. Goniostat, it should be something very simple. Uh, uh, we need uh, uh, to, from time to time to change the wavelength, which should be very simple. Uh, the crystal should be placed in the beam, not uh, in the center of the beam. Uh, the size of the, we should uh, uh, be able to change the size of the beam. And on some way, we should uh, handle radiation damage. And again, in theory, this is very simple. In practice, it's not. And on many beam lines, and people, as a solution, they are buying $2 million detector, because this is the easiest thing. Yes, the more difficult is to make a, a monochromator on which you can change wavelength uh, in the matter of minutes. Or, and this is not always true. Uh, quite often, crystal is coming out uh, of the beam, and here it was shown a few times on this meeting. Mm, and uh, there are many theoretical papers how to handle radiation damage, but in practice, uh, people still are doing things as they were doing before. And even if a processing program has a correction for radiation damage, quite often we do not know, or even people do not know, how this experiment was made. Uh, and we have one, of, one problem. So what and you can examine PDB, some PDB deposits. What experiments, uh, was, what experimenters or people who deposit the structures know about the recollection? And as you see, very little. Yes, the answer for all questions was very simple, no. Yes, no, I don't know, basically. Or I do not uh, have time to, to put the proper information. But what we, we look, for the deposits from last 15 years, and we found very interesting correlation. And I have to say, Marek, who is here, did that, and I didn't believe that uh, uh, in this correlation until I, see, I saw the results. Uh, the red curve is 15, uh, 15 nels or more, and uh, uh, blue curve is 20 nulls and more. And you may argue that R3 is not the best way to measure 
the structure quality, but uh, uh, if you average for many structures, there is some way to do that. And you see that you have significant difference between these two types of the deposits. And we are talking about thousands of the deposits in every, in every group. So it's not done, um, it's not anecdotal evidence. And in some sense, I realized some time ago that it would be fantastic to have a repository which would keep raw data because we could learn from raw data much more than we can learn from PDB. I mean, in the sense, at least, of data collection. And we can, and sometimes we really have to reprocess the data to get better structure and I would say little different structure. And this is something which is the result of uh, big data, uh, NIH Big Data Initiative. It's uh, mm, the system which now has over 3,300 diffraction experiments and over 6,000 data sets. The, as I told you at the beginning, the storage is not a problem at all. Yes, the real problem is to organize the data and also reprocess some data uh, or resolve the structure and check what we can have out of that. And I will uh, show you only two things. And, and this is, you see that this is the really, really the illustration what the big data is, the, the prob what is the problem of the big data. If we have a stock, a stack of CDs or DVDs, we will never find the movie which we want. If we will put that on the shelf, oh, it can be done, but it's very difficult. But if we will dump that into computer, the problem does not exist. Yes, we can do any search, and it's not important how many bytes uh, is in every movie or how many bytes we have. If we have too many for our storage, we can buy additional disk. And I just checked today that the 10 terabyte disk is around $300. Uh, and you see that when you are looking at PDB, you have, there is, if the data were deposited in proteindiffraction.org, you can by one click get to this data, you can download the data, or you can learn more about metadata, which we uh, uh, got, I mean, the same, you will have the same information which we got during processing. So what, uh, what we have learned from that, actually I was again shocked looking at the results because here it's very simple uh, statistics. It's here the uh, uh, longest unit cell and here oscillation range and blue are uh, unbin data or pixel array detector data and red are uh, uh, bin, uh, bin data. And you see, what you can see that even for 400 angstrom unit cell, people are doing one angstrom oscillation. This what does it mean that, that all high resolution data are overlapped? Yes. Uh, and here uh, it's the same. So you see people have some, their uh, uh, experimental parameters which they like or experimental parameters which were set by the person who collected data before or experimental parameters which were set by the uh, beamline staff. And people really do not think what they should do. They would like quite often to have one number for all, which would cover all experiments. 
Unfortunately, you have engaged your brain. I'm, I'm sorry, this is bad news. So what we are doing in my lab to uh, increase the uh, output, it's a, we are doing everything with database control pipeline. What does it mean? It's a little old. Nobody is using PDA. People are using tablets. But basically, everything is the same, that everything what we are doing uh, including uh, everything in the wet lab is uh, controlled by the database and some things, if they hook up properly, the data are harvested without user intervention. So there is no censorship. Yes, uh, quite, people, quite often people are saying, is your or somebody else's database handle negative results? Obviously, it has to handle negative results because it has to handle uh, the experiments, all experiments. If the database handles positive results, it's really a report for the funding agency, not the database. And this is very, very uh, important to realize. And Sometimes, at least, this partly works in my lab. It should work, but, it, but we have various glitches. The database is really a nervous system. Yes, there's something which sends uh, information about, uh, about problems. And sometimes I am saying that the, if the structure is determined, it's not interesting. It's a, like a patient who is dead. Yes, what is really interesting is the situation when we cannot solve the structure and we are searching the database to find the reason for that. So you, you see that the disadvantage, obviously, is that uh, it's a big brother and I'm getting every Friday the information what has happened in the lab during last week or during last months by name, project, and, uh, and method. And this is really not to uh, find for people who are not working hard enough. I have, the, in my lab, I have the opposite, the opposite situation. People are, some people are working too hard and I have to push them home if they are staying too long. But it's really fine to where are the bottlenecks, because we always have bottlenecks. So where are the real bottlenecks? And you see, I would, obviously, I would love to say that the real bottleneck is data collection and processing and structure determination, but I decided not to cheat you and to tell you the truth. The real bottleneck is sample. Yes, and this is the difference between physics and protein or, and biology, that the, we sometimes have tremendous problem to repeat, for instance, crystallization, or even repeat purification, exactly. Even if the protocol is exactly written and we have everything in database, because you know, it's enough that you are using different lot, lot of the reagent from the same company, but just different lot, and you have slightly different results. So really, uh, the problem is to get crystals. And I would like to disappoint you that in cryo-EM, the problem of sample, you are not getting crystals, but you have some problems of getting best sample and the same is with NMR, and it's the same with any methodology. And you have to realize that the uh, price of the crystal, the crystal is more expensive than any diamond. Yes, by weight and by uh, uh, volume. Uh, so, 
we are trying to get as much as possible from one crystal. And this is some nice example when we couldn't initially resolve uh, uh, solve the structure because we have two uh, lattices in one sample. And uh, what we have done, we, as you may see, we modified the program to process each lattice separately. We merge these lattices and structure is done. I'm sorry, uh, this is not published yet. And, uh, it's from my lab and from time to time I have projects which I judge sem semi-important. So, uh, I cannot show people. So this is the uh, people collecting data at SBC, people from my lab, uh, Max Rusch and Marcin Zimborowski, and we are still going to the synchrotron. From time to time we are using remote data collection, but we are going. Why we are going to the synchrotron? As you see, the data are collected here, but people look not at the uh, crystal, but they are look at electron density map. And this is map which was produced from the crystal which is there, which is uh, in the hatch. Why? Because we are trying to find out what to do next. And recently, we are using more, if we are going to the synchrotron, we are using more Andrzej Akimiak wet lab than synchrotron line. Because uh, if we would like to evaluate the ligands, we can find the ligand, but we have to do I, some other biomedical experiments. Uh, and we have something which are I am calling inverse remote access. People who are in the lab, they know immediately about uh, what is going on on the beam line, and they can do, for instance, ITC experiments in the lab and feed information to people at the synchrotron. It, and it's again, this is the, some way to increase the output, not in the sense of number of structure, but in the sense of number of papers, because you cannot publish now uh, structure if you, do not, if you have only structure. And you see, but sometimes we cannot find the uh, ligand, or we can have various problems with uh, other methods because, for instance, his tag may compete with a ligand for an active site if we will not cut his tag. If we will not his, and the same is, is with HEPES protein, a HEPES uh, uh, reagent. And sometimes the effect of his tag on some ITC measurement, uh, some kinetic measurements are disastrous. And what we should do really, what is very important for reproducibility is to, when we produce the protein, we should produce not only for crystallization for crystals, but also we should use the same batch for all other experiments. And you see that this is again something which was deposited, and people didn't bother, despite of continuous density, they didn't bother uh, to model his stock. And there are many such structures in PDB, and this is one of our structure when we found that uh, his stock really promotes dimerization of the protein. We couldn't cleave just because of that. Again, the problem with HIPES is that uh, in 18% of uh, HIPES uh, are in close vicinity of the active site. And 
we are trying uh, to look at that. And this may be a source of the problems with reproducibility, because as you know, the last two years, there is avalanche of papers which complain about re reproducibility of the results. And this is even Francis Collins' uh, paper about new standards which NIH is going to apply. But in reality, if you measure once with his stack and second time without, this is the source. This is the source of problems with reproducibility. We are getting perfect results. Yes, and I disagree when the, the, this is the how much more money we are spending for uh, to get one uh, uh, or the same number of approvals uh, by FDA. It's uh, 20 times more in 2010 than in uh, 1980. And sometimes people are saying that, look, that this is because these uh, crazy academicians who are fighting for tenure or for promotion or for grant, and they are pushing results uh, even if uh, these results are not uh, very well checked. And in the... Uh, and. Uh, there was a social, sociological experiment which were performed on a group of scientists, and uh, they asked three questions. First question, if we will uh, def define the uh, good model of science as an open science, that we share the result, we discuss the result, uh, do you agree with such a model? And the answer... 95% people answer yes, and 5% answer no. The next question was, are you using this model? And again, 10% of people answer yes. Uh, and the next question, what about your peers? And the answer was, only 25% of people are using this model. So you see that we are... I mean, we are, as a scientist, are trying to present ourselves as an angels surrounded by demons. And it's not true. Yes, we are more or less the same. And this is the example which I would like to give you. Again, uh, uh, th this is the part uh, uh, of the article, one of this article, the unspoken rule is that at least 50% of the studies published even in top-tier academic journals, Science, Nature, Cell, can be repeated with the same conclusion by an industrial lab. Yes? So, we found by accident the paper which was published by Commercial Lab. Yes? Quite good paper. RCR 11, four, uh, 416 citations. But as you see, structure was not perfect. So what we have done, we, that this is the structure from PDB, 2.4 angstrom, 28% are free, 18% are. It was done a long time ago, so I, I wouldn't complain about that. But very fast, we uh, uh, make much better structure. And, oh, wow, wow, wow. And, uh, and you see that there was clear error. Yes, this is the mold stack. And it, it was a clear error in tracing. And probably it has the uh, uh, biomedical uh, significance. And for that reason, I'm not uh, giving you the uh, PDP deposit. We would like to publish that. So we are not so bad. We are not so bad uh, as some people think. 
We are just the same. Yes, we are just the same like others. I and mean, some of us are a little better, some of us are a little worse, but it's really not easy to do these things. I, here is the one more thing, the number of waters dropped from 71 to 46. So this is, Molstack is a great tool for testing various hypotheses. Because not always you can say what ligands you are. Yes, quite often you see that it's not what you suspected it will be. It's not what you want it will be. And here it's a very nice uh, way of uh, presenting various hypothesis. And this is the uh, structure which was uh, solved, 5i for f. And uh, people claim that uh, there are two combinations of two ligands with, uh, 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 with different uh, conformations. And here you have electron density map. And uh, no, I'm sorry. Okay, and this is the second uh, second uh, side, but we model different ligand, and it's okay for both sides. Yes, uh, so. This is nice way, and this is accessible here, and it's very nice addition to the paper. When you really can, and if you have uh, that on the web, you can manipulate that, and you have very, very nice way of really judge whether hypothesis is correct or not. And here is another example uh, when. Uh, the mist, uh, when people uh, saw that they have uh, a, a complex with uh, pentapeptide, and in reality it was nothing. Yes? And you may have various problems. You see, sometimes you cannot solve structure because what your sample is not the same as you think it is, because it may be crystallization or purification artifact. You may crystallize something else. I'm not saying even about simple things like mixing vials in the uh, freezer, but you can work on something long, long time ago. Now there is a, uh, wait a second, a problem with validation. And this is the example of the uh, validation of metals, which should be simpler than uh, multi-atom ligands, but it's not always so easy to validate. And if you will look into the PDB, the significant fraction of uh, metals are suspicious. I'm not saying that they are wrong. They are suspicious. Yes, that if you will run that through the check my metal, I do not like what I see, but sometimes I cannot uh, really make a judgment. And how important is to check the metal? Really, we found that in uh, Oh, it's almost five, it's five years. People uh, uploaded over 13,000 data sets. Yes, or, or in the form of the PDB, and it was done from almost 3,000 different uh, computer addresses. We do not track, and from 47 countries. Before people uh, also validated 4,700 uh, of structures which are already in PDB. But you see what I found today, that this number is growing fast 
this is, this became slow. Yes, that everybody was trying to find what he or she is getting. In fact, what we should do, at least for zinc, we should, or for many other metals, we should do experiments above and below absorption edge. Yes, the problem is that on some beam lines, if we would like to change the wavelength, it takes long time. So people skip that part. Yes, there is a push to do things faster. Local lichen density, as you see, again, there is a problem and uh, and you really should look at that and again the large number of not large but I would say 10% of structures are uh, suspicious and this is our work with uh, this platin, when we took the raw data and processed that to 2-point angstrom resolution instead of 2.4. And we got, uh, we cut uh, uh, frames uh, which were affected by uh, radiation damage. So you really can do, if you will keep all your data, you really can do much better uh, you really can do much better structure. But unfortunately, people would like to do everything fast and high throughput. Yes, so we have automatic cloning, high throughput automatic expression, and so on. And the only problem is automatic paper writing. Yes, and this is... Uh, uh, for some people, it's the only problem because... This is the point, if we have everything high throughput, and everything works, and sometimes it does. Sometimes it does. Uh, it's really, uh, the only problem is to write the paper, which will be accepted. And at that point, uh, you have to engage your brain. Yes, and this is the problem if everything before went very easy and very fast. And this is the example of the uh, uh, impact of automation in the wet lab. That this is the uh, ratio of hanging drop to sitting drop experiments, if they are uh, reported, between uh, 1994 and 2015. And as you see, this has changed seven times. I'm sorry, I didn't see the paper which would show that sitting drop is better than hanging drop. The only thing what I know is that the, all these automatic observation systems, they are based on sitting drop. And in, even in my lab, when I am trying to tell somebody, maybe you could try hanging drop, there, there is some resistance. Yes, because it's easier. And optimal data collection. Again, automation, complete automation. And sometimes uh, people really do not see, especially if you see that this is low resolution data, the background noise here is comparable comparable with speed. And again, remember that there is no noise-free detector. There are readout noise-free detectors, but there are no noise-free detectors. I have to say that some of these things which I've shown, I did in collaboration with many people. And this is the list of collaborations, or not the least, but uh, institutions which, with whom I had joint paper. And I think that these people, really, they are anonymous, but 
they should be acknowledged first. Because, and more people with whom I had collaborations, but they didn't, uh, but the fruit was not the paper, but it was something else. Some, sometimes very, very important. Uh, and influence of other people, looking how other people are doing experiments and what they are doing is extremely important and very beneficial. At least it was beneficial to, uh, for me. And I have here a list of people from my lab, uh, Dominica, uh, some people who were called yesterday Polish Mafia, uh, and uh, structured genomic centers in which uh, I was a part of, um, and various people who are doing fantastic software, which we uh, were taken uh, one way or the other uh, for that. And obviously, funding agencies, I will make the last tribute to my lab. Uh, and these are fantastic, hardworking people uh, and very talented. Uh, and I feel privileged that I am among them. Thank you very much. Well, thank, thank you very much, Vladek, for this um, in, inspiring presentation. Um, we have time for a couple of questions. Please use the microphone if you want to ask something. I don't think it's on. There we go. Hi, Vladek. Beautiful talk. You showed a very interesting slide where you um, compared a deposit that had all nulls or very many, or you showed a deposit with many nulls, and then you showed deposits with more than 50 nulls versus less than 20, and you showed their free R was less. And um, so the easy interpretation of that is that these were structures where pe the ones who had a lot of nulls were structures where people didn't spend a lot of effort on that structure. And so as a result, the free R was not on average as, as good. And actually, I take that as sort of a synopsis of your talk, that my conclusion from your discussion is spend the time to do the experiment right and think about it thoroughly. Yes, I agree. I absolutely agree with you. You see, protein crystallography is experimental science. We have to realize that it's experimental science. And when we, at least for structure determination, the synchrotron or home X-ray experiment is the last experiment you are doing. Yes, and you see what I shown with zinc. Yes, I mean, it was fantastic benefit uh, of that because we found uh, that uh, people views of zinc in albumin and there were number of groups which were working on that were completely, uh, not completely, but slightly distorted. Yes, at, at the beginning, people's reaction is, it's impossible, yes? Because I have exafs, I have this, I have that experiment, impossible. Yes, and we had uh, uh, a lot of discussion. We published two papers together, uh, and now we have fantastic collaboration with other things. So you, so you see that if people are not, uh, if people are willing to accept that they are making mistakes, and we are all making mistakes, we are all making mistakes. I, and, but if we are well, willing to accept that and correct that, it's fantastic. And the science really, it's a great pleasure. Uh, I think that John is here, yes? Yes, and this, this was the same, yes? That, that uh, uh, we have disagreement, and maybe we still have some disagreements, but we can work together. 
My conclusion from that slide was that you have discovered a new quality indicator for structures. The fewer nulls, the better the structure, right? I'm sorry. My, con my conclusion from that, so from that slide was that you have discovered a new quality indicator for structures. Uh, the, 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 the fewer nulls, the, more, the better the structure. <laughs> yeah. John. Vladek, great, great talk, and thank you very much for the kind acknowledgement. Um, I wasn't going to um, comment on the cisplatin. Uh, you've raised it. There has indeed been a to and fro process, and this sharing of the raw diffraction images, uh, what Vladek has demonstrated, and it is my own firm belief, really can improve things. And the issue there on the cisplatin is the difficulty technically of distinguishing between chloride and amine which is not so very different in number of electrons, especially if the occupancy is lower. The key point was, in fact, that platinum is binding to the histidine in the biomedical sense. We have taken the uh, initiative further that um, uh, Vladek and Ivan Shabalin, who I was, had the pleasure to meet in New Orleans uh, recently, we've also then, in this to and fro process, as Vladek and I uh, hammered out the wording for our joint paper in structure uh, is now at 1.7 angstrom. Rather, I wanted to pick up on your uh, cryo -M EM in the age of X ray crystallography should be changed to X ray crystallography in the age of cryo EM. This is an opinion that I will offer instead. I think we're in the age of integrating techniques. And within our one uh, specialism, for us here, let's say, X-ray crystallography, we need to do better uh, and aim for the very best. And the precision of what we do will improve. But accuracy, you and I both are trained physicists, accuracy comes from getting the same results from different techniques. And the challenge to us, I think, is the mastering of other techniques that can corroborate the very best precision that we can get from X-ray crystallography via the other technique. A particular Achilles heel that I think we have, and you brought it out beautifully, is to persuade the protein into the crystal. We use quite often a cocktail of crystallization uh, uh, compounds. And it takes us into a non-ideal Belief. Thank you. Yes, I, I agree 100% that uh, we shouldn't be protein crystallographers or uh, physicists or even physicists or chemists. We should be scientists and we should use all uh, or not all various techniques which would prove that our hypothesis is right. Yes, and this is but, but you see, if we would like to do that, we have to take care of other things because if we are uh, uh, doing one experiment in different pH than the other experiment, there is no surprise that we are getting different results. And these different results may be functional. Yes, so you are absolutely right. Okay, one last question back there. Yeah. So I want your expert op opinion on one aspect. Often we see... Uh, you, you see, I mean, this is more political question than... <laughs> but I can try to answer. Uh, look, uh, you are working on uh, very difficult project, yes? Your crystals diffract, let's say crystals, diffract to five angstrom. You, can, you have some information. Should you trust that information or should you try to publish? And I understand that people publish this information, but on the other hand, everybody should realize the limitations of the technique. Yes, that, that, and people do not want to accept that. People are trying... Uh, to treat the PDB uh, deposit as a, his master voice, yes, that it's 
uh, it's true, but it's not always true, and not always in the deposit we can have a mark uh, of, uh, which would allow us to say that, okay, this ligand can be questioned. And this is the uh, uh, reason why we wrote that Mondstadt, that anybody can go to the uh, server, can create his interpretation of uh, structure, and somebody else may import that and make his interpretation or her interpretation. So you have something which would, you are using the same data uh, the, I mean, the, in the sense of the structure factors, uh, and, but you can put different interpretation. The next step is to try to get from this data, from raw data, a little more than people who did experiment have done. So you, you see, I am not surprised that people are trying to uh, mm, uh, uh, publish important five angstrom structure in nature and science. Yes? And nature and science would like to have such a things. But yes, some people were, telling, were saying that they are not going to publish in nature and science anymore. Yes? Nobel Prize, several Nobel Prize winners decided not to publish. And maybe the Editors have too much power. I don't know. Yes. Thank you. All right. Let's thank Vladek once more for a beautiful talk. <clears throat> and, and I would like to invite Dr. Banerjee to the stage to give to present Vladek with a token of appreciation. On behalf of the organizers, it's my real pleasure to present a token of appreciation to Professor Vladek Minor. Thank you. Thank you. Also, on behalf of the organizers, it's a real pleasure to present a token of appreciation to Manfred for stepping in at the very last moment on our request. Manfred, thank you very much. Thank you very much.